Often it's the case that a unit's treatment is determined by whether another variable of theirs is above or below a threshold. And this leads to the idea of regression discontinuity. Now the basic idea is that people just above the threshold get treated, and people just below the threshold don't get treated. And yet, these people are basically the same. There's really no systematic difference between the people who got a score just above the threshold and people who got something just below it. So we have something that looks like a randomized experiment. The people who were just above get treated. The people who are just below don't get treated. So if there's no systematic difference between those groups, then we can just compare the average outcomes in the people on the right-hand side of the cutoff with people on the left-hand side of the cutoff. And that's it. So the best way to understand this is to go straight to an example. And we're going to go to the very first study that ever used this, in fact, that invented regressionist continuity, a paper by Thistlethwaite and Campbell in 1960. Now, they were interested in the following question. How does receiving social recognition for outstanding academic achievement affect various outcomes, like whether you win scholarships or whether you want to go on to college or not. You know, does it affect your career plans? So here's how they tried to answer that. They used data from the National Merit Scholarship Program, which started in 1955 and continues to today. Now, I'm going to give you a simplified overview of exactly how this program works. I'm going to leave out a few details just so I can focus on the main essence of their identification idea. So today, here's how it works. There's about 1.5 million high school students who take the PSAT exam. Now, of those students, 50,000 or so of the highest students are taken. And among them, 16,000 of the highest students are given a certificate of merit, and the rest are not. Now, why is a certificate of merit important? Because they showed, the authors, that in 1960, the people who got their certificate of merit were um, more likely, 2.5 times more likely to be precise, to be mentioned in newspaper articles than the students who didn't, who had gotten just below the cutoff for getting their certificate of merit, the test score cutoff. In addition, those, those students who got their certificate of merit um, their names were all put in books and distributed to colleges and universities and to scholarship granting agencies. So the people who got a certificate of merit, they got more public recognition than the students who didn't. So what we can do is look at the effect of getting a certificate of merit or not on various outcomes. And that's basically going to tell us something about the effect of public recognition. That's their main idea. So let's go look at the data and see what they found. So here's the first main results from the Thistleway and Campbell paper. Over here on our horizontal axis, we've got aptitude test scores of students in arbitrary units. So this is their PSAT test score, basically. And by arbitrary units, they mean that they've normalized the scale of test scores for, the, for this population of students. So right here in this dotted line, that's the cutoff test score for getting a certificate of merit. So everyone who got test scores up here, the high test score winners, these people all got certificate of merit. These people down here, they did not get the certificate of merit. So what's on the vertical axis? That's the percentage of students winning scholarships. So we've got two lines, which are up here in almost illegible words. The first line up here labeled G is just the percentage of students winning any scholarship whatsoever. This line is the percentage of students winning scholarships of $150 or more, which maybe that doesn't sound like a very big scholarship these days, but if you put this in, this is $1960, if you put it in today's dollars, you get something around $1,200. So that's more, a lot more substantial. So these are the big scholarships, and these are the small ones. So there's a few things to notice to begin with. If we just look over here, we see that the percentage of students winning scholarships is increasing in your test score. So that seems to make sense. People who get higher test scores um, win more scholarships on average. 
in both uh, overall and high paying scholarships. Now over here, we actually see the kind of opposite. So forget about these, just look at the high scoring students. Over here we see the opposite trend. Um, getting a higher test score actually means you get less scholarships. But why is that? Well, that's because the people who are over here did really well on the PSAT test, and it made them more likely to actually go all the way to the end of this process and get a national merit scholarship. So if you received a national merit scholarship, then it's less likely that you'll receive an outside scholarship from some other agency or scholarship granting um, group. So that's why we actually see it going down, because here we're looking at overall scholarships, not including national merit. Okay, so that's, that's the basic layout of this table. Now let's look at the regression discontinuity idea. So here, by the cutoff, the basic idea is that um, the people who are just below the cutoff are essentially the same as the people who are just above. That if they had taken the test on a different day, maybe the person who scored a 10 would have gotten an 11. And maybe the person who had gotten an 11 would have gotten a 10, just because of something completely random. No, not because of any systematic difference between these two groups. So that means that we can compare the students who just got about a 10 with the students who just got an 11. And any difference in average outcomes between these two groups is solely attributed to the fact that the people on the right-hand side of the cutoff got a certificate of merit and the people on the left didn't. So if you do that comparison, you can see that there is a jump. There's a discontinuity in the regression line or a regression discontinuity right here. It seems that the people who got their certificate of merit had about, let's say, about 51% compared to about 46%. So there's a 5% gap or a 5% treatment effect of getting the certificate of merit. So that's one result. And then we see the same thing's true for overall scholarships, not just for the high paying ones, that there's this discontinuity of roughly 5 to 6% of students. And that difference there at the boundary, at the cutoff, is our estimated treatment effect. Now this was 1960 and we've come a long way in understanding how do we compute confidence intervals for these differences right at the boundary, which is not an easy thing to do. So you can see these lines are really wiggly. So if you actually were to take this data and compute a confidence interval, even though our point estimate the, just the difference in these regression lines we see is positive, so that suggests there is a treatment effect, which is what the authors conclude, we actually wouldn't have a statistically significant effect because of all the excess variation that's going on over here. So that's the basic idea of regression discontinuity. Now there's one more thing I want to mention. Now on the horizontal axis, this is test score. So it's very important that we're looking close to the cutoff because if we were to just compare everybody over here on this group, say take the average uh, percentage of students uh, winning scholarships over here, the average outcome, and compare it to the average outcome over here, we would also see that overall the average is higher. Overall here the average is, is higher. Maybe it's about the same, but it's a little bit higher it looks like. But that would be confounded because the students on average over here have better test scores. That's why they're over here in the first place. The people over here on average have worse test scores than these. So there's a confounding variable with our treatment. It's only once we look close to the cutoff that that confounding variable is no longer an issue because close to the cutoff, these students all have roughly the same test score. So that is very important. We have to look just next to the cutoff and only compare averages on the right with averages on the left. That's the main idea.